Hello again, and welcome to another Bible study in the life of David. Today we're in 2 Samuel, chapters 7 and 8. If you were to go to the National Gallery, just off Trafalgar Square in London, one of the paintings you would probably want to see, it's very popular, is The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. It's a magnificent, large piece. As you stand in front of it, looking at it, you see these two men dressed in Tudor clothing, The Ambassadors, by a table, and at the foot of one of them is a long piece of fish bone. It looks a bit like cuttlefish, such as you'd put, give to a budgerigar, but it's, it's very long. It's about a yard long, I imagine, or, or a metre or so. If you then take a few steps to the side of the painting and look at the same painting from a different perspective, that long piece of cuttlefish reduces to the size of a human skull. It really is a quite remarkable piece of art. Depending on where you're standing, you see something different. Your perspective is affected by where you are. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we will find David's perspective on something and God's perspective on that same thing were entirely different from one another. The chapter itself divides neatly into a plan, a prophecy, a promise and a prayer. Let's look firstly then at the plan Verses 1 to 3. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. David has always been an activist. You know that by now. He was a shepherd, he was a court musician. He was an army champion, he was an army commander. He got into trouble with Saul and had to run away. He had to climb out of windows to save his own life. He became the leader of a motley crew. He conquered Jerusalem and brought the ark into that city. But David doesn't seem to handle downtime very well. His palace has now been built. King Hiram of Tyre, we see in a previous chapter, had provided stonemasons and workers and cedar wood for the construction of this palace. He had a palace. What was he going to do next? Ah, he had a bright idea. I know what I'll do. I'll build for the Lord a temple. The Lord's living in a tent. The Ark of the Covenant is in the tabernacle. I'll build him a proper temple. And he asked advice from a prophet, from Nathan. And the Nathan said, good idea, go ahead. The Lord is with you. How interesting. This is the first occurrence in the Bible of Nathan the prophet and the very first thing he says, he makes an error. There's a lesson for us all there, I'm sure. His first recorded pronouncement in the Bible turned out to be wrong. That's a bit of a theme in these books, isn't it? Remember Eli? He was a priest. He was mistaken over Hannah's drunkenness. Remember Samuel decided to make his sons judges but they took bribes in court. Remember Jesse? who ignored his eighth son when Samuel wanted to see all the sons to decide which one was to be king. Remember Jonathan. Jonathan said to David, I know that one day you're going to be king and I'm going to be your second in command. Yes, David was king, but Jonathan did live that long. And now Nathan too, in good faith, is making a mistake in giving David the advice to go ahead and build the temple. So in verses 4 to 11, or the first half of verse 11, we have a prophecy. If you were to look at it, you would find the word I, the personal pronoun there, 12 times at least. And the I in this prophecy is God. God is speaking to David through Nathan. And he's telling David what he has done for him. He has taken him from the past, from the pasture. He has been with him wherever he went. He's cut off all his enemies. He's going to make his name great. I will provide a place for you. I will plant them. I will appoint leaders. I will give you rest from all your enemies. God is saying, I'm going to do this, this, this and that. So much. But I don't want you to build me a temple. My perspective, God's perspective on this is entirely different from yours. I never asked for a temple. I don't want you to build one. In the next part of the chapter, we have the promise. 
The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up for your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. God is saying, you wanted to build a house for me? Don't. I'm going to build a house for you. Not a, a structure like a palace or a church, but a dynasty. Just as in our country we have the house of Hanover with uh, King George I and II, III and IV, and the, the house of Windsor with George VI and Queen Elizabeth II, and now Charles III. A house in the sense of a dynasty. God is going to give David a dynasty. He says, your f flesh and blood will succeed you. Now that never happened for Saul, did it? Jonathan never did become king, neither did Mel Melchizedek. None of Saul's descendants ascended to the throne. But, says God, your son will build a house. He's not named. We know in retrospect that this is Solomon. And God says he will establish Solomon's throne forever. God and Solomon will have a father and son relationship. If Solomon does wrong, which he did, God would deal with him. He would discipline him. But God would not take the throne from him. How long would God keep these promises? In verse 13, I will establish the throne forever. My love will never be taken away. Your kingdom will endure forever. And this promise of a, a kingship forever gave rise to the messianic hope that one day God will send a Messiah, his anointed one, who would be Israel's king, but would reign forever and ever. He also says in verse 13 that this house would be a house for my name, for God's name. Now, Buckingham Palace, before it was Buckingham Palace, was Buckingham House. It was built by the Duke of Buckingham, and it was the best residence in London. Guess whose glory it was built for? <laughs> it was built for the glory of the Duke of Buckingham. In New York, there's a Trump Tower, and we know whose glory that one is named after. God is saying, I'm going to give you a house for my name, for my glory, for the glory of God. And so in the New Testament, Gabriel came to Mary, and Gabriel said, the Lord God will give him, Jesus, her baby, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign forever. His kingdom will never end. And there's a scripture about Jesus which says, your throne, O God, will last forever. It is Jesus who is the fulfilment of this prophecy. It is Jesus who will inherit David's throne and reign as king on God's throne forever for the glory of God's name. So we've seen a plan, a prophecy, and a promise. Then, in the last half of the chapter, we have a prayer. In verse 18, King David, it says, went in and sat before the Lord. Went into what? There's no temple. Well, this was the tent that David had erected to cover the Ark of the Covenant. Not the tabernacle, that is still outside Jerusalem. That hasn't been brought in yet. But the Ark is covered with this tent. And David went in there to talk to the Lord and the Lord to him. And in this prayer, six times... David calls God Sovereign Lord. That's in the New International Version. If you're using the authorised version, O Lord God. In the Hebrew, Adonai Yahweh. David is recognising that the Lord is sovereign over all. And he's amazed at what God is promising to do. And he says, who am I? And what is my family that I've been chosen for this? He has this strong sense of unworthiness. He keeps asking, why me? In verse 19, God has spoken about the future for a human being, for a mere man. Why me? Says David. I don't know what to say in verse 20. 
and you've made your word and your will known to me. Why me, he says again in verse 21. And then in verse 22, we have this great statement of monotheism. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. David isn't comparing the Lord with all the gods of the people around, of which there were many. He is saying they're nothing, they're no gods. They have no content whatsoever, they don't even exist. You, Lord, are the only Lord, the only God, the only sovereign of the universe, the world, Israel, and my kingdom. And Israel and God are in a unique relationship with one another in verse 24. The uniqueness of the re this relationship is not in Israel's achievements, but in God's choice and God's power. And verses 25 to 29, David asks God to do what he has promised to do. Do as you promised, so your name will be great. Establish David's house, my legacy. You've promised to build a house. Well, God, please go ahead and build a house. This is rather odd to us, isn't it? That David is asking God to do something which God has promised to do. We'll return to that thought later. Please bless my house. Please may my house continue forever. With, with, your, with your blessing, it will happen. Yes, it's odd for God to ask us to pray for that which God is going to do, which, that which God has promised. But think of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. God's name has been hallowed, is being hallowed, and one day will be hallowed by every human being who's ever drawn breath. Thy kingdom come. God's kingdom has come in the coming of Jesus. It is coming with the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. And it will come ultimately when Jesus Christ returns. We're praying for what God has promised to do. Thy will be done. God rules. He's not an absent monarch who has no power in this world. God rules. And we pray that God will do what God wants to do. A rather peculiar take there on our personal prayers, that we will pray for that which God has promised to do. Well, there's chapter 7. Let's move on now to chapter 8. Now, verse 1 of chapter 8 is odd because of first 1 of chapter 7. Let me read chapter 7, verse 1 first. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet. 8 verse 1, In the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and he took control of the Philistines. So in chapter 7 is saying it's all been done, and chapter 8 is saying David's still got a work to do. This reminds us that this book, these books by whoever wrote 1 and 2 Samuel, were not written strictly in a chronological order. Chapter 8 is full of victories of David, and they fit best between chapter 5 and chapter 6. In verse 3, we're told that all the, um, the surrounding countries in the north, the south, the east and the west, all of them have been subdued by David. But David, in subduing his enemies, could be ruthless. Let me read verse 2. David also defeated the Moabites, he made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with the length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. I bet they did. You know the meaning of the word decimate? Um, it comes from the time of the Roman army, from the Roman word for ten. And if there was a Roman unit which had disobeyed orders, the unit would be lined up in... in from left to right, and then a soldier, a centurion, would go along counting off every tenth man, eight, nine, ten, for execution. Seventeen and nineteen, twenty for execution. Thirty for execution. Every tenth man was executed as a disciplinary measure on the Romans. That sounds bad enough to us. David, out of every three Moabites, he put two of them to the sword. David knew how to be firm. David knew even how to be ruthless. 
in verse 5 of this chapter, in a battle, David slaughtered 22,000 of the enemy. And in verse 13, 13, sorry, 18,000 of the enemy. You remember earlier how he chopped off Goliath's head and then taken it to the walls of Jerusalem and waved it around and said, ha ha, this is going to happen to you one day. The message was, you don't mess with King David. He is the king of the whole of what we would call the Holy Land, that part of the Middle East. And you rival kingdoms, you've no chance. And if you try it out, David will deal with you extremely severely. The Old Testament seldom comments on matters of morality like this. Booty is coming into Jerusalem as well. It says in verse 7, gold shields, um, a great quantity of bronze, in verse 8, verse 12, articles of silver, gold and bronze, all, the, all these precious metals were coming into Jerusalem. What did he do with all these precious metals? What he didn't do was keep them for himself. He didn't make himself wealthy on the backs of the enemies whose wealth had been stolen. It says in verse 11, King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued. He put the Lord first and he dedicated all this wealth to the glory of God. And then in the last section of chapter 8, verses 15 to 18, David appoints his cabinet. He knows he can't run the country on his own. He needs others to do jobs with him. And the first appointment he makes is to the Secretary of State for Justice. But he keeps that portfolio for himself. David decides he will continue as the Lord Chief Justice of Israel. And later, Absalom uses that as a stick to beat him with. The Secretary of State for Defence will be Joab. Joab who had killed or murdered Abner. Joab who had captured Jerusalem on behalf of David. In charge of the records, verse 16, Jehoshaphat. Don't compare that with a later king of Israel, Jehoshaphat. Then in verse 17, he appointed an archbishop of Canterbury and an archbishop of York, Zadok and Ahimelech, to be the chief priests in the land. And later in the story, Zadok is instrumental in ensuring that Solomon becomes the next king. But this is the first time Zadok is mentioned. Sariah is appointed as the cabinet secretary. And then David has personal bodyguards. They're commanded by Beniah, but these bodyguards are, let's forget this word, Kerithites and Pelethites. These were Philistines. These were men who had been loyal to David since the days when David had stayed in Gath, in Philistia. Do you remember those days? Some people had remained loyal to David, even though they were Philistines, and they were still loyal to David, commanded by Beniah, but they were the personal bodyguard of the king. Rather like the Brigade of Guards in England are the personal bodyguards of King Charles today. So David knew how to organise a government. And it says in verse 6 and verse 14, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Notice how the author phrases that. He avoids building up a personality cult. He doesn't say, David went forth and had victory wherever he went. He ascribes the victory to God. And he says, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. The hero of this story is God, not the king. Now then, if all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, as the Bible says it is, how can these two chapters help us in our walk with Christ. Well, in chapter 7, we saw that God's perspective and David's perspective were entirely different about building a house. You remember the painting, the cuttlefish, which turned into the image of a skull, depending on your vantage point, you saw a different image. And God and David saw things in a different way. And we have to take this on board in our lives, that God is above us, he knows all things. And he sees our lives and what's happening to us in our lives differently from the way we see them. Yesterday, 
Today and forever, Jesus, God, is the same. Yesterday and tomorrow have equal validity with God as today. God doesn't see today as standing out as being different from the other days. We do. That's our perspective. God's perspective is to look at the whole of time from the creation in Genesis chapter 1 right through to the recreation, the rebirth of creation in, Gen in Revelation chapter 22. God's perspective is a divine one. We have to acknowledge that. Also in chapter 7, we noted that the prophet's first decision for God was a wrong one. He made a mistake. And how often do we set out to do something for Christ in his kingdom and our motives are good and our hearts are, are right and yet somehow we get it all together wrong. We make a right mess of it. It's the right pig's ear. And we say, oh dear, I'm never going to do that again. That wasn't Nathan's attitude. He got it wrong. God spoke to him and he went back to David and said, Sorry, my lord, I, I got that wrong. God is saying something different now. He is going to give you a house, a dynasty, which will last forever. If you've made a mistake in serving Jesus Christ, get up, dust yourself off, pray about it, bring it to the Lord, analyse it, and then go ahead and try to serve God again. Also in that chapter, God spoke to David, or through David, through Nathan to David, 12 times using the personal pronoun, I. I have done this, I have done that, I have taken you, I have been with you, I have cut off your enemies, I will make your name great, I will provide a place for you, I will give you rest. I, I, I. God had done so many things for David, and God was going to do so many things for David. If David had known it, he might have known, sung that 19th century hymn, hymn it's a bit corny, Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. God has done so many things for you. The obvious things, he's chosen you, he's given you faith, he's saved you through faith and grace, he's put the Holy Spirit within you, he's, he's changing you and, 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 and turning you to, like Christ, to be like Christ. Count your many blessings, because God has done so many things for you and will go on doing so many things for you. In the first half of the chapter, David received many promises. And in the second half, he prayed about the promises. God may have made you promises. God may have done wonderful things for you and he's promised to do future wonderful things for you. Pray that those things will come to pass. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But remember also, God said to Solomon, or through Nathan, he said, when this king comes about, if he disobeys me, I will discipline him. Listen to this from the book of Hebrews. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You will go wrong in your Christian life. You will slip, you will fall, you will sin, you will disobey God. That's not to be taken for granted, but it is a fact. God will discipline you. And he says, it's hard hardship. You won't like it. It's not pleasant. You won't endure it. But it is for your good. It is to make you more holy it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for you. So just as God would discipline Solomon, God would discipline you. And just going back to the first thing I said arising out of chapter 7, if I may, Nathan's mistake. Don't do what God hasn't told you to do and don't try to exercise a gift which you haven't got. If you step out to try to do something for God, which God hasn't asked you to do, 
Or if you step out and exercising a gift which you haven't received, then you are going to fall flat on your face. Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is a, a, a chapter of victories of David's. But it ended with him appointing a cabinet because he knew he had to plan for after the victories. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Wesley and Whitfield. Wesley and Whitfield helped in the founding of the Methodist churches as we know them today, back in the 18th century. They were both giants as preachers. But most experts today estimate that Whitfield was a greater preacher than Wesley. He had thousands of converts, Wesley too, but Whitfield had a particularly effective ministry in preaching the gospel. But he wasn't a planner. And many of those converts were, went astray. They were lost. Wesley was a planner. He sorted his converts out into groups, into cell groups, as we would call them, home groups. And there, those converts tended to last. David and Wesley planned for after the success. They planned for after the blessing how they would cope with it. And that's why in our church here in Derby City Church we have an evening service now. We're trying to grow the numbers of our home groups. We're trying to uh, increase the numbers studying the Bible. We're trying to reach out through Alpha and so on. We're buying new buildings to accommodate all that we want to do. We are trying to plan for post-blessing. We're trying to pan for what we will do after the victories that God is going to give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these two chapters. The first may be they didn't seem to offer us very much blessing, but now they do. We thank you that your perspective is so much greater than ours. We pray you'll help us to be humble enough to accept your perspective and to work according to your plans. Help us not to step out into areas that you've not called us to. Help us not to exercise gifts we haven't received, but help us absolutely to do all those things for Jesus that we can. Help us to count our blessings, we pray. You've been so good to us, Lord. We do apologise to you, Father, for times when we have sinned and we have been disciplined. It wasn't nice, it was painful. Help us, we pray, to grow more holy and more righteous and more peaceful as a result of your discipline. And as for all the churches represented watching these YouTubes, Lord, we pray that our churches will be structured so that when blessing comes and indeed when revival comes, we will be able to accommodate the numbers who will be adding to the church and joining the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. For your name's sake, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.